Most of the material that we're talking about in these units have come from our own counseling experience. Daniel and I are the co-directors of the counseling department for here at Crossway, and most of you visited the counseling center, so you now know where the counseling center is. So this unit comes out of our own experience, our own teaching, our own um, counseling experience, what we've learned is wisdom as we've gone along the way. So we're happy to share with you tonight what we're calling Living Free of Stress. So you should have a purple sheet as your cover page and then a set of notes for session one. All right, Building Godly Self-Esteem. Introduction. We all know the importance of physical health, but what about good mental health? Remember the parable Jesus told about the foolish man who built his house on the sand and the wise man who built his house on the rock? And what happened when the storms came to the house on the sand? It crashed, it fell down. The house built on the rock did what? Stood firm. And some of you that went through Sunday school and learned that little, little song of the wise man built his house upon the rock. Remember that song? But the main aim of it is that when we build our life on the foundation that we find in Christ, that's a firm, solid foundation. Obtaining self-worth is much like that. And if this was a sec secular course talking about self-worth, and you can find a lot of them out there, you have to be careful what it's built on. So godly self-worth is built on a foundation that comes from God, from the Bible. You can see I'm expecting you to talk back to me, so don't forget to talk back to me. In counseling, so obtaining self-worth is much like that. Do we build on the sand with the world's self-centered sense of importance or is the foundation of self-esteem found in God's view of who He says we really are? And that's building on the rock. So right from the start, you can see Christian self-esteem is far different than secular classes in self-esteem because one builds on self and the other builds on God. In session one, which is what we're doing tonight, we examine a common issue. Why don't I feel better about myself? How do I get a better sense of self-worth? Loving myself is biblical and important in Jesus' view of mental health. And right from the start, a lot of Christians are going to challenge that statement. Is loving yourself important? Aren't we supposed to deny ourselves and die to self and... How does that compare with loving self? Come on, talk back to me. If you don't love yourself, you're not going to love anybody else. It's true. So we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So if I don't have much concern and care for my neighbor, what does that say about Susan's love for herself? Might be some problems in there. So we love God and we love neighbor as... We love ourselves. So godly self-esteem means we do love, each, love ourselves, that we set appropriate boundaries. We know self-care. We know how to take care of ourselves. Good coping skills to deal with the issues of stressful living are based on good self-worth and healthy self-esteem. So if we're going to talk about coping with stress, which is the theme of this whole unit. That's built on healthy coping skills. Now, if you didn't love yourself and you didn't value yourself, why would you learn how to cope with stress? You might as well just swallow it, grit your teeth, endure and be shattered and broken. But if we love ourselves, it means we sail through the stress with God's help. It doesn't mean we come under it and get crushed. Does that make sense? So, good coping skills to deal with the issues of stressful living are based on good self-worth and healthy self-esteem. And Father God wants to build dignity into us. The question becomes, will we let him? So God wants us to have the dignity that was given to Adam and Eve. He created them in his own image. He gave them a lot of self-worth, a lot of dignity just on who they were. So if we're learning about stress and how to handle stress and how to handle anxiety, how to go through depression and all those other things, it's got to be built on the concept that God gives us the dignity that He wants us to love ourselves in a healthy way. Agree? Disagree? Hmm. 
Now, for a lot of Christians, especially those of us that have come up through the church structure where we've learned death to self, where we've learned, um, you know, you just got to die to your wants and your wishes, etc., 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 it's hard to get that balance. Now, we've got two spots up the front, and Daniel's just about ready to get us another table. Now, you can see how important it is to, to, if you're taking more of our classes, just to give Kay a call and say, yep, I'm going to try to come there. Because on our books, we only had 15. <coughs> and how many people have we got here? So it just helps us to run off notes so that Daniel doesn't have the last minute to go dash off notes. And so if you're going to do more classes with us, just up and ask if you can do that. That's not a problem. All right, go back and pick up where we want to, where we were. So learning how to take care of ourselves, learning how to live with stress has got to be based on dignity. It's got to be based on healthy self-worth, not on the I'm just going to die to myself in here and grit my teeth and bear it. There's got to be that balance in there. So those of us that have come up in this church structure, we've probably had a fairly heavy dose of learning to die to self. And hey, that's a biblical principle, and I know that works, because anybody that's walked very long with the Lord has got to learn how to do that, so that works. But somewhere is the balance between dying to self and saying, hey, I need a godly self-esteem in all of this. So there's got to be a balance, right? Yeah, it's like the, the, the scales, you can't, the, the teeter-totter. You can't go too far one way or you hit the bottom. You can't go too far the other way or you hit the bottom. So it's one of those issues where there's got to be a balance. In our later sessions, we trace the slide of stress into burnout and then on to deeper anxiety issues. So today we're looking just as at building godly self-esteem because that's the, the foundation. Next week, we're going to talk about stress and burnout. And I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people that have gone through stress and burnout. And once you're in burnout, it's a pretty sorry desert that you're into. So not learning how to handle stress right, you can slip into burnout. Other people go into anxiety. Now, nobody, you know, anxiety is pretty horrible to be in, too. I don't know if any of you have gone through panic attacks, but I see people quite often who are in the middle of trying to understand how come it happens and why and when and where. So learning to handle stress correctly will prevent burnout. Learning how to handle stress correctly will prevent most anxiety problems. Learning how to handle stress correctly will prevent most depression problems as well. But it's a journey. Right now I'm saying the word most because why? Why can't I say all depression is cured by handling stress? Doesn't work. That's right. Doesn't work because sometimes depression goes on so long that the actual chemical processes in the brain do change. And then it's a whole different ball game if you've got the chemical imbalances that, you, that you're fighting in depression. Now, Daniel just says he's got some extra pens there. If anybody needs a pen. So in session, letter session, we trace the slide of stress into burnout and then on to deeper anxiety issues. Looking at the common threads of depression in this study on good mental health. And in session five, what we'll have is a workshop where we can do some practical um, issues in this so that either I send you a way to work with the Lord on some issues or we evaluate our own stress, stress level and how we're learning how to cope with stress. So session five is a workshop session. We, we will see that the root causes of our view of self is found in the half-truths and the outright lies that our heart still believes. And that's very true. The reason why people slide into, into burnout and anxiety and often into depression is because somewhere in there are some half-truths and some heart lies that they believe. They might believe that they're, they're not worthwhile, so why should they take care of themselves? And that is a big lie, isn't it? Because every single person born in the human form is valuable to God, aren't we? God gives us a dignity, a self-worth. And sometimes it's finding that enough from ourselves and stepping away from our own hurts and fears and rejection and all those other issues to say, hey, God loves me, therefore I'm worth taking care of myself in here. 
So root cause often is buried in the way we treat ourselves and how we view ourselves. And some of that is heart lives and half-truths that we still believe, maybe because our parents always told us that we were hopeless or whatever, whatever. Or we believe the lie of a lot of the secular teaching that you know, we're powerlessness in our situation. There's nothing that we can do to get out of the stress that we're in. And that's not true. So we'll be looking at some of those views as we go through. So that's a bit of an introduction to the first four sessions and then the workshop. Any comments or questions as so we go along? Okay, we're, we're a nice big group. Um, I know there will be times when you will want to say, Susan, yeah, but... And you can you know, always just slip up your hand or whatever, and we can take some time and get sidetracked for a little bit. We try to get through about eight pages in two, an hour and a half, have a coffee break about, well, we break it at, at uh, 8.30, so we'll have about 15, 20 minute coffee break where you can get to know each other as well as just have a, a nicotine, uh, nicotine, have a caffeine <laughs> fix if you need to. <laughs> and if anybody needs that, you know, I set you free. I'm, I'm not going to judge you. There's outside, but where we can just have a bit of a cuppa and relax and you can let the muscles in your bum relax a little bit too from sitting on hard chairs. Capital B, being made in the image of Jesus gives us self-worth. Now you can see I've got a blank spot in there. I'm not sure whether it's just to make sure that you're awake or give you something to do with your pen so that your mind feels like it's still got something to do in all of this. But there'll be blank spots throughout all of this. Now, did you get a unit? Uh -huh. Would somebody just grab the one there on the chair for? I think Daniel ran off an extra one. Yep, so one right there. Yep, there you go. Thank you. It'll now make more sense. The highest position in the universe is being a daughter or a son of God. A loving Father created us in His image to take our place with Him in heaven. And one day, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 3, we will even judge the angels. That's a pretty amazing position. When you've decided to allow Jesus into your heart and your life, Father God began a remodeling project. He began to adjust your unique, special, God-giving personality by the measuring stick of Susan, the local church, your pastor, whoever is the flavor of the month, Billy Graham or whoever. No, what's the measuring stick? Jesus. Jesus. Our all-knowing Creator is reshaping your every trait into line with the greatest example of health and wholeness ever known. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, we're being conformed to His image. Not to somebody else's image and not even conformed to our own image. Isn't that good news? Because I don't know about you, sometimes my measuring stick of Susan is pretty unrealistic and pretty high expectations. So we're not even being remade into, my, into our own image. We're being remade into Jesus' image. However, you are not being destroyed in the process. Sometimes it might feel like it, but I guarantee that's not what the Lord is after. You are not being destroyed in the process. He knows your specialness, where your potential lies, and how to bring you to wholeness. He also loves you too much to leave you in your pain and misery. We are able to yield to His pl plans when we know it is a God of love who is working on us. Now, I get lots of people in the counseling center that come up and say, well, Susan, how come, if it's a God of love, how come that happened or whatever happened or whatever happened? And somewhere in there you have to say, well, we know that God is a God of love. So whatever is happening, somewhere in there must be a God of love's hand. And that's a big issue for lots of people when they go through counseling. But one of the biggest lies that we've been sold and that our heart often believes is that God is not a God of love. Because things happen to us that we have no idea how we can come out of the crushed, broken state that we're in right now. But we must believe that somewhere in here there is a God of love in all of this. So we must be able, we, we are able to yield to His plans when we know logically that God is a God of love, does that help us? A little bit it might help us, 
But what part of us has got to know that it's a God of love that's working with us? Our heart. That's right. And for most people, there's a big gap between head and heart. Head can believe lots of different things, and heart says, I don't know about that. I'll just do what I want to do. So to know in our heart that we are working with a God of love is very important when you look at self-worth issues and why things happen to us. Well, capital C, our worth depends on our view of self. Our worth depends on our view of self. <coughs> Number one, self-identity is found in our belief system. Found in our belief system. <coughs> Daniel, can you rustle up one more pen? It looked like one pen died. Over here. We can define self-identity as the, poten the foundational personal belief about our total personality. So sometimes it helps to pin down a definition. So self-identity, what we're going to settle on is the foundational personal beliefs about our total personality, and that's our self-identity. So how I believe about my capabilities, my limitations, um, how I got to be where I'm at today, the potential as a woman in Christ, the potential as a wife, the potential of being on team at Crossway, all of that is part of my view of myself. And so it's, lim it's found in our belief system. This includes all the inner attitudes about ourselves, our feelings of value, worth, the fears, the beliefs we've developed since childhood. In fact, I was reading today in a, in a child development book that by the time a child is five, they're halfway to their adult mentality. So if you've got any five-year-olds that you know of, they're halfway to their adult mentality. Isn't that amazing? It also contains our view of God-given needs and desires, what we really believe about ourselves. So our self-identity contains all the views we have about who God is and His place in our life and how important He is with us and how uh, all His plans work. You got another dead pen or are you okay? Daniel, another dead pen. <laughs> if we think of ourselves as hopeless and valueless, we will either push ourselves or we will accomplish little. So if we think of ourselves as hopeless and valueless, it really depends on what we do with our life. If we're positive about our worth, we'll be free to achieve our potential and our health will benefit. If I keep saying to myself, Ah, oh, Susan, you just made a mess of things. You failed again. You're hopeless and all of that. You'll never get beyond square one. You'll never, never, never. And I just go round and round and be negative with myself. What's going to happen to my whole outlook on life? I'm just going to go downhill and downhill and downhill and downhill. But if I have the view that, hey, God and I, if I'm doing what God has asked me to do, if I'm following His path in here, then I'm tapped into a bigger power source than I am. And so, hey, as God tells me what to do, I'm His, his servant, I'm His daughter, I'm His precious child, so I just do what God tells me to do. And it's his responsibility. If he's ordered the cake, he gets to pay for it, right? So there's a lot of difference between me pushing out there out of my low self-esteem and saying, God, I'm connected with you. My value is in you. So healthy self-esteem has got to be based in God. Two, the Christian view versus the world's view of self. The Christian view versus the world's view of self. And for those of, of us that have done some of the other courses at the beginning of the year, we spend a lot of time looking at the secular view of, of us through the humanist uh, evolution eyes rather than the Christian eyes. So the world's evolutionary view is that mankind is just a step above the primate kingdom, in some ways a better class of chimpanzee because we've got free will, we've got choice, we can build skyscrapers. But if, if you're an evolutionist, that's all we are. We've just evolved into a greater, greater, more potential ape than our cousins, the apes. However, the Christian view of self-worth elevates us above animals. 
God speaks about our origins, tells us of being made in His image. The Bible also acknowledges our sins and our failures, but gives us a way out of major blockages such as the guilt, anxiety, fear, and insecurity. So God says we're made in His image. We're not made in the image of a, an ape, a chimpanzee. We're made in God's image. So there's a huge difference between just being the next step on the evolutionary chain to being made in the image of God. Now, there are only two alternatives. It's interesting when you really take away all the bits and pieces, there really are only two alternatives. Either we're just advanced, and this is somebody's quote, and really liked it, so I put it in. Either we're just advanced tadpoles, which is a, do you call them tadpoles in Australia? Yes. Yes, okay. I get tripped up every once in a while. You can tell by my accent I'm not from Australia. So I get tip, tripped up on things like teeter-totters and seesaws and a few other bits and pieces along the way. So advanced tadpoles. Or as the Bible presents us, a little lower than the angels. And there's only two choices in that. Are we just another step in the evolution process, an accident in time and space, or are we the work of a creator genius, the God of the universe? How we answer this question will give us the foundation of our self-worth. Because if our heart really, really, really believes that we are God's creation, how are we going to act? Like God's creation. If our heart believes some of the evolution stuff that you get around on TV of the billions and billions and billions of years, how's our heart going to act? the way the world acts. So if we really believed as God's people that we were created by Him with a divine, divinely inherited image, it would change most of the people <coughs> that I see in the counseling offices. So again, we've got to get it from head down into where our heart really believes that. So number three, what self-worth is and what it is not. What self-worth is and what it is not. Some people think self-worth is on the right left-hand column, but what real self-worth is is on the right-hand column. So self-worth is not a sense of superiority, elevating us above others with arrogant self-estimation, puffed up, overconfident with prideful masks of, I'm all right, even when we know we're not. That's not what good self-worth is. So someone who's arrogantly puffed up does not mean they've got a good sense of self-worth. In fact, probably the opposite. So self-worth in God's view is God's view of our failures and our successes. Does that mean God can recognize that we've made successes of things and say, job well done? Sure. So God's view of our failures and our successes. Recognizing our true value and place with Father God equally important with other members of his family. So does that mean that Susan's is equally important as Billy Graham? Or the newest Christian that just came in five seconds ago? Yes. It's a, a level playing field. It's not, oh, I've been a Christian 40 years, so I must be way up here. It doesn't work that way. God's view of us is, is very, very, very special. He's 100% for each one of us. Next page, self-worth is not someone who always wants their own way, who's stubborn without consideration for others. That's not good self-worth. In fact, it, quite the opposite for many people. True self-love is being sensitive to the needs and wants of others, being hospitable and willing to be corrected. Because if you've got a healthy, mature sense of self-worth, can someone who is authority in your life, a God-given authority, come to you and say, well, you did lots of good things, and you accept it? You've got a good sense of self-worth? Yeah. Can someone who is in an authority come and say, you've done lots of good things, but here's one thing you need to pull up your socks on, and you can accept it? Yes, if you've got a healthy self-worth. If you don't have a healthy self-worth, then the... the the person in authority, whether it's the pastor or your boss at work, if he comes and says how good you're doing, whoa, I'm great here if I don't have a good sense of self-worth. Or if that person comes and says, okay, this needs to be changed and looked at. If I don't have a self-worth, that's going to throw me into lots of rejection. 
Maybe that guy really doesn't like me and maybe I really can't stand. So you can see again, self-worth, the healthy Christian self-worth can be a basis of 101 things, but the maturity that comes with a good sense of self-worth is what's going to pull us through. So, again, self-worth is not self-centered, wanting others to revolve around them, gaining attention by inhibiting others, easily upset or hurt. Again, those are signs of a not very good self-worth. So if you think of, of any bullies that you know that are out to intimidate, manipulate, and force other people to do what it is they want them to, would they have a very good sense of self-worth? No. No. Because often the bullies of the world come from a really bad self-worth. So they're trying to make everybody else do what they want as a false way of getting their self-worth built up. So true self-love can leave behind the need for undue attention. It is not self-seeking but patient, self-controlled, and steady. And it also means when good attention comes your way, it doesn't make you big-headed or you know, fall off the rails. You can think of a lot of uh, people around the place that, in fact, that's one of God's tests, is how do we handle it when people do come and give praise to us about how good we're doing? Because a lot of people go off the rails at that point because they don't have a healthy sense of self-worth that says, okay, I can do good and get praise, I can do not so good and get praise, but all of it is centered back in Jesus, in the Father. So there, those are three examples of what self-worth is and what it is not. Any comments on any of that? I can see the wheels turning. This, it is this unlimited worth, security, and significance in God that helps us rise above the traps of a poor self-image. Over and over and over and over and over again, Jesus declared our personal value. We must build on this firm foundation. Give me a couple of examples how Jesus stressed the personal value of the individual. Sorry? The woman at the well. The woman at the well. Yes, keep going. He died on the cross, definitely. Keep going. Good. All the parables that pointed to how important that lost son, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost treasure, etc., etc., etc. Yes. Make us some more. What does it say about the hairs on your head? <laughs> he loves you so much he knows when one slips out or one turns gray. He feeds the sparrows. He, he takes care of you. In fact, I really am, I am really convinced that most of us, our God is too small. You know, we have this little box of a God where, let me just make sure I haven't covered this somewhere else in here, I don't think so, where I know, you know, it's like God is big enough that he can be 100% focused on one person, 100% focused on another person, 100% focused on that next person, so much so that he is totally 100% aware of where each person is that has ever been conceived, that is being conceived at this minute, and that will be conceived out in the future. He is big enough to be totally with each individual, aware of their needs, their problems, their frustrations, big enough that he's gently wooing their spirit to him, whether they're a Christian or not a Christian. He's that big. You know, it's amazing, it's amazing to me to think they haven't found the edge of space. You know that? The scientists can't say, yep, that's the edge of the galaxy. We're not going to get any further than that. And if you're a Star Trek fan, they haven't even found the edge of the galaxy, have they? They're way out in, in you know, billions of light years away. Now, is God out there in those billions of light years away? You betcha. There are cosmos systems, suns, stars, planets, whatever, whatever, that we will never, ever see this side of death. And God's out there. He's that big to keep all of that in motion, keep all of that going, the, the, all the planets around the sun. He's big enough that he keeps all of that going. And yet he's totally focused on each one of us. And a lot of people 
particularly in the counseling center, it's like their, bo their God is this big. He only sees me on Sunday. He only sees me do the bad things in life. He's sitting there with this great big stick. He's going to hit me over the head if I step out of line. Where God is, oh, you know, the finite mind has trouble considering that God is outside of time and space, let alone that God is omnipresent. You know, he's totally 100% with each person that's ever been conceived, is now being conceived, or shall be conceived in the future till Jesus comes. Isn't that amazing? That is a mind-blowing thought. Now, our God is that big. So can he solve, help us solve the problems of our life? He better be, or we're in the wrong, <laughs> wrong business. You betcha. So we must build on this firm foundation. We all strive to balance the lessons of our own experience and others' perceptions of us. As a growing child, we develop what's called a world view of ourselves. The where do I fit into all of this questionings. This process, process begins before birth in another's I perceptions of our identity. The baby before he or she is born is so much part of the mother that the baby's world and the mother's world is one. And it's not until a child gets to be about one and a half and two years old that they begin to see that hey, I'm separate from her. And that whole concept of self begins to get developed. That's why the terrible twos, and why they're called the terrible twos, because at that point they begin to say, me do it, no. And they begin to assert their sense of self at that age. And those of us that have worked with twos, we know that's exactly what they go through. Because they're learning that they are separate identity from mother. Up until then, it's all been part of the whole flow of where Mother was at. The construction of this unconscious self-image continues as we build our personality, especially during the first five years of life. As children, we will view ourselves as we learn who we are, how? In the eyes of others. So no child is born with a fully developed sense of self. We learn who we are in the eyes of other people. And that's pretty, pretty uh, amazing, isn't it? It's one of the God-given principles that God wanted in a healthy, godly family for the child just to take on godly characteristics. But as we're seeing as the world, world's falling apart more and more, children are being affected more and more. Subtle and sometimes intentional messages from others take root in our heart as truth affecting every part of our life. And it's interesting, those of you that were here Sunday at Crossway, Stuart Robinson, the senior pastor, had a message about children. And I thought, guess what we're talking about tonight? So, children learn, live by what they learn. If a child lives with criticism, they learn to condemn. If they live with hostility, they learn how to fight. If a child lives, lives with shame, they learn how to feel guilty. If a child lives with ridicule, they learn how to be shy. If a child lives with tolerance, they learn how to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, they learn confidence. If a child lives with praise, they learn to appreciate. If a child lives with fairness, they learn justice. If a child lives with security, they learn to have faith. If a child lives with disapproval, with, sorry, with approval, Susan, with approval, they learn to like themselves. So if a child lives with acceptance and friendship, they learn to find love in the world. It's like a story that I remember back when I was in high school reading about um, a lady that came to a new village. And the first person, person that she saw, the man said, well, how... You know, welcome to the village. How did you find your last life, your last village? And she said, well, there were people there who were critical and hard, people there who I just struggled to get to know, people that just ignored me and rejected me. And the guy said, well, guess what? You're going to find them in this village. And then another lady came by and was moving into the village, and he asked the same question. How did you find the people in your last village? 
and she said, there were people there that were so friendly and so helpful that just went out of their way to help me. They went out of their way to be a comfort and a support. And I hated to live my last village because people were just so loving. What do you think he said? You'll find these people here as well. So, if we learn to find, well, if we live with acceptance and friendship, then we'll learn to find love in the world. If we live with criticism and rejection and not being good enough and always failing in somebody else's eyes, we will find what in the world? That very same thing. Never being good enough for somebody else. Number two, other people's messages may not be true, however. So not everything that little child learns about themselves is going to be truth. We generally strive to live up to this self-image created by others' perception of, perceptions of us. If, we think, if they think of us as a good kid, we will show this in our behavior. However, if our self-worth has been crushed, threatened, or demeaned, a different self-image and behavior will result. So if we've got a, a friendly, encouraging, uh, unconditional love for ourselves as a child, we'll learn to live up to that image. But if it's always crushing, always demeaning, always criticizing, always put down, then that's what we learn to live up to too. And we're crushed in the, co in the process. The way we learn to think about ourselves depends on a large measure on how our parents have treated us and what our siblings and peers think of us. However, many of these messages are not truth. And I'm sure some of you can think just from your own life that the things that your parents said about you, that as you've gotten to be an adult and struggled in the real world, you've come to the conclusion that, hey, my mother didn't quite have the full picture about me, one way or another. Any comments on that? Is that true? In fact, one person I read said that you spend your first 20 years living at home. You spend your next 10 years finding out that what your parents told you about yourself wasn't totally true. Then you spend your next 20 years trying to sort out who you really are. And it's only the last 10, 15 years of your life that you become comfortable with who you are. Does that seem about right? So for most people, is that encouragement or discouragement? <laughs> mm. Now again, it depends on parents. If they had a godly view and they concentrated hard on bringing you up on God's principles, you probably got a pretty good dose of God to build your self-worth on. But most of us that grew up in secular homes before our parents came to, to, to the Lord wasn't quite so. Hmm. True. Any comments on that? Particularly, particularly people when we do come to the Lord and we see that His view of us wasn't quite what our parents thought of us. It wasn't quite what my dad said about me. Jesus had a much better image, a much better prospect for me than what my parents did. Now to show you an example of this, um, I wanted to share a case study with you. And all the case studies that Daniel and I share with the class are a conglomeration of about three or four different studies to three or four different cases so that you can't say, hey, that sounds like my neighbor. I wonder if it was so-and-so next door. Because we've so changed the story that you couldn't even sort out, even if it was your sister that we we're talking about, you wouldn't know. So this person I've called Molly. And Molly came to us because she was really struggling with her marriage. And she began to share with us that she went through a lot of abuse as a child. In fact, she grew up in one of those houses where mother came around and just made sure she was dressed perfectly beautiful little girl. So she was never allowed to play in the dirt. She was never allowed to go out and climb trees. She was certainly never allowed to get dirty beyond, you know, just a slight smudge. Mother would always hover around and make sure she was this good little girl. And so what did she learn about herself when, when she came to counseling? It was all falling apart. Because what has she learned as a child? Tell me what you think she would have learned from that sort of background. 
That's right. She was only lovable if she was good and clean and perfect. So how did she obtain being good, lovable and perfect? Guess how much mental energy went into this huge measuring stick that she carried around with her everywhere she went. Oh, I can't do that because I might get dirty. I can't say that because I might be polluted. I can't say that. I can't do this. I can't. She had this huge long list of can and can't do because she was trying hard to be clean, lovable, and accepted. Yes, Daniel. Have a yep. Good, shall do. Uh, Carrie and Don, you just need to catch me a little bit later. Okay, so Molly came to us as a counselor and she started talking about her present life conditions. She shared with us about her home life. What do you think her home life was like? She had a son and a daughter herself and a husband. Describe for me what you think she may have shared as far as her home life. trying to run a perfect house and those of us that are around children are children perfect so she was tearing her hair out that's one yep what else perfect. trying to be the perfect wife so she was always dressed perfectly she had on this beautiful crisp dress when husband walked through the door had dinner ready had slippers ready had everything ready for for him but what was happening on the inside she was just frazzled to a, a you know, huge anxiety problems were starting to develop because she hadn't really learned even who she was to start with. She described her furniture that still, she had plastic just in case the kids should get the, the furniture dirty. Her, her couches were all covered in plastic. She had a little dustpan hidden behind the, the on the, the table by the couch that she'd just go around after her kids if they made any crumbs on the floor. Anybody that came into their house that smoked, it was like she was going like this all the time. So she was on the edge. Now husband, who was attracted to this beautiful woman and married her because he probably thought, wow, I've got this perfect little sex kitten and she is just all my heart could desire, found out that what was she like in the bedroom? She wasn't a perfect little, yeah. In fact, she was almost frozen. So her next complaint was that her husband was off somewhere else with another woman. She couldn't understand why. And so we began pulling apart some of the half-truths and the heart lies. And it was just exactly what you said. The only way people are going to love me is if I'm perfect. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know very many pe perfect people in the world. Do you know many perfect people in the world? No. We're all a combination of lots of other things, but perfect, we're not. So do you think she had many friends and many people around her? No, because the measuring stick she used on herself, what did she do to her friends? Used them on her friends as well. So her friends got tired of the negative criticism that they would get if they didn't have every hair in place and every perfect fashion and their fingernails done and everything, that they could feel her judgment come across. And so she lost a lot of good friends that way. So we began pulling apart some of the things that mother had told her as a child began working through some of the half-truths, some of the heart lies, got her to the point to see that, hey, I let my little boy fall off the bike and I don't come and, and berate him when he makes a mistake. Shouldn't I be able to fall off the bike and not get torn to shreds and all this too? And so she began to set herself free to start making mistakes. And again, I don't know about you, but I don't know many people who don't make mistakes, myself included. So she began to give herself permission to go back and look at all the things that she thought her whole foundation of her childhood were built on that she thought were truth and began pulling it apart. And we saw her for about six or seven sessions and at the end of that she was beginning to change, beginning to become human, not this super perfect model. And she was beginning to see that all of her anxiety stuff, her panic, all of her stuff that was surrounding it was because her self-image was based on the sand, not on the rock. So, does that help us understand a little bit more about Molly? Hmm. It's true. So what we get fed into us as children 
greatly is going to affect the way we are now. It's like our mind is like a big computer. You've probably heard this before. Garbage in means garbage out. Truth in means truth out. So if all of us during our childhood had lots of half-truths, lies, and other people's wrong perceptions typed into our computer, what does that mean for us today? It's still in there. And unless we let the Lord come in and really begin to examine and pull apart some of these half-truths and, and heart lies, guaranteed that's still what we're living our life out of. And that's one of the things that Jesus came to do. He delighted to bring truth and freedom and wholeness. That's why he came for us. And that's our journey with him. Let's see if we can just knock off this last one. In healthy families, our worth is assured. Our worth is assured. So we can see this cycle developing. And if you want to put arrows around to show that it's a cycle, you can do that. The ways we are treated equals the ways that we think about ourselves. Next arrow, which affects the way we behave, which affects the next arrow, the way that others treat us. The way that others treat us feeds back into the, the affects the ways we think about ourselves, affects the way we behave, which affects the way others treat us, which feels that affects the way that we behave. So you see, that's a cycle. So if I've grown up thinking I am a worm, because of the ways that I was treated, how am I going to act? Like a worm. How are others going to treat me? Like a worm, which affects the way I see myself, which is a worm, which means how am I going to act? Like a worm, which other people are going to treat me like? A worm, which means I'm going to think of myself as? A worm. And you can just see how the cycle just goes round and round, round and round, round and round and round. Now, the sad thing about it is that we get a lot of people in the counseling center who think they're a worm, but they're really what? They're an eagle. They have been created as an eagle in God's view. And so God expects them and has created them as an eagle, and they're pretend pretending that they're a worm. Now, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I can't think of more silly things than to see an eagle pretend that it's a worm. It doesn't work that way, does it? It doesn't have a very strong beak, for one thing, to be able to... So, what's the moral of what I'm trying to tell you? Put it in your words. Give it back to me. What am I trying to tell you? Mm -hmm. To see ourselves the way God sees us, because that's how we're going to act. How will people treat us? the way that God sees us, mostly, if they understand what's happening here. Because if I act like I'm a child of God and I've got that healthy self-image, other people are going to treat me that way, which reinforces how I act, which reinforces how people treat me. A lot of times in the counseling center we get people who feel powerless because they're in a powerless marriage. They're in a marriage where they're just struggling for their last breath because based on self-image stuff. So how does a husband treat them? Like they're powerless, like they're struggling for the last breath. How do other people, particularly sometimes mother-in-laws and husband's friends, might treat her exactly the same way? So that reinforces how she thinks about herself. And you can just see the cycle is just a downward spiral based on how we view ourselves. Or you can have some women that are in a really hopeless, terrible marriage that have so learned, hey, I'm not that helpless worm over here. I'm God's creation. I'm his daughter. And therefore, I'm learning how to get biblical principles into this. And it gets to the point after a while that husband does not treat him like a worm because he sees the change on the inside of them. And that's part of the... And the opposite reaction can happen, too. It can, e can either fight it, which means he treats her twice as bad, or he begins to be one to Christ by her good behavior. Yes, he can have two different reactions. Mm. That's true. Mm. But you're right. You know, we are looking for respect from others, and we should respect ourselves first. That's right. In fact, I can't receive from other people what I'm not willing to give myself. And again, we have a lot of people that are coming in that are just, you know, crushed, 
because just because they haven't learned how to take care of themselves, they don't have boundaries, that's sort of the buzzword, uh, they haven't got good, healthy self-esteem. And so it's hard for them to take care of themselves. But yet they're looking for other people. They're looking for husband to do it. They're looking for friends to do it. They're looking for pastor to do it. They're looking for counselor to do it. And sometimes we have to say, look, if you, you can't receive from other people what you're not willing to do for yourself. So learning some good self-care helps restore that balance. Mm. Mm -hmm. Or if you've got a child with a genuine behavioral problem, mm -hmm. so it naturally won't be approved of all the time. Mm -hmm. So the child will then take in um, yeah. the negative about itself. In yes. Yeah. So what do you do about that? The, the yeah. child will grow up with that. Thing. Yeah, that's true, because that's the, the computer in stuff is what's in there. So it could be a child that's hyperactive or ADD and, and really getting a lot of bullying from others around or put down. Yes, that goes into their computer. So you as a godly pr parent, besides praying and praying and doing lots more praying, almost have to make up for some of the abuses of the bullies and the children around in their world. But you, the parent would also, there'd be times when they'd have to refer mm -hmm. and their behavior yes. wouldn't be Yes. So that child would then see the parent as seeing them as negative, wouldn't they? Even although they might mm. have laughed at other times. Yeah. You always respond to that. Yeah. You take that in more, don't you? Yeah. But one of the, the challenges for all parents is how to bring firm discipline without rejection getting into it, of how to bring that good boundary line, because there's always got to be boundary lines. We're seeing more and more people in the council room that had no boundary lines. And certainly that's happening out in the secular world where there is, you know, anything goes. Where we as Christians and godly parents have got to bring boundary lines. It's part of what God does to us. Does God let us just go and go and do whatever we want without any consequences of our actions? No. We often run into brick walls because God says, I love you too much to let that just keep going on and going on and going on. Whether it's breaking body rules like just getting fatter and fatter and fatter if we eat chocolate too much or you know, if we drive too fast on the road, there's a policeman or you know, there have got to be godly boundaries in it. But yes, for every parent, how to bring the godly boundary without the child thinking, oh, my parents hate me and I'm terrible and I always make a mistake. It's always a challenge. The child wasn't, didn't think that. They knew there was love there. Mm -hmm. They would view themselves yes. with some negative because they would know that. Um, yeah, without getting yeah too bogged down in this, they're, they're, you know, the way a child feels about themselves, there's going to be a sense of, okay, I made a mistake there. You know, parents can bring that concept of, okay, Johnny, you, you did that wrong. Yeah, you made a mistake. Now let's try to do something different. These are the consequences of your choice. And sometimes parents have to spell out consequences because there's got to be consequences. But to help the child see that, okay, you made a mistake. And especially like what you were mentioning, if there's a handicap there in the child to start with, like ADD or something like that, it's going to affect their view of themselves in the long run. And again, that's probably the best thing that we as parents can do is bring the child to Jesus. Because we've all been damaged by our parents. I guarantee that those of you that are parents, you've damaged your children, etc., etc., etc. That's why we all need Jesus in here. Hmm. What about, like, for example, if your parents, they're, like, good to you, like, they, tr they discipline you well, mm -hmm. and they give you all that love, mm -hmm. but just say you go to primary school and you get um, bullies or whoever yeah. abusing you, Yeah. it's not your parents' fault, but those True. people. So what happens then? Well, then a wise parent will, you know, bring that child back and certainly know the signs of that happening because a lot of children go through bullying in high school and parents don't know about it. So as parents, you need to be aware of the signs of bullying. Um, but to bring them back in and make sure that if they know Jesus, you certainly pray about it. Certainly ask the Lord to be healing, all that effect. But somehow the child needs to learn how to stand up to bullies. And I'm not saying take them out to karate and teach them all the worldly ways of handling the bullies. But somehow there needs to be a, a, a hand, learning how to handle bullies for all of us.
And I think that's something that children need to learn how to do young because the biggest bully of all is who? Bully of all is Satan. And if we haven't learned to stand up to bullies in our childhood and in our teenage years, somewhere along in there, we'll just be bullied by the biggest bully of all. Hmm. So, in a healthy family, a child is allowed to develop a sense of self, sense of initiative, and a sense of choice. In abusive families, a child develops a negative view of their capabilities, their value, and their worth. Children who are severely punished feel rejected, have insecure feelings, and develop negative pictures of themselves. In fact, counselors talk about A level of abuse and B level of abuse. You heard that? So A, people who, who go through actual physical, sexual, emotional abuse are classified as going through type A abuse. But there's a huge group of children out here that go through type B abuse, and that's when things were not done for them. So they may grow up in a, in a godly home, but yet their, their, their um, basic needs have been neglected. They haven't developed a sense of being loving. They haven't had the love and nurturing that they needed as a child. So type A abuse is a physical, emotional abuse that's done to a child, and that leaves huge, deep scars. But type B abuse is the things that were not done for that child, and that brings huge, great big scars too for not having the nurturing on the inside that we needed. It's important for children to measure their own self-worth, to measure their self-worth on inner values rather than outward appearances on others' belief or the desperate need for others' approval. And that certainly is a mature growing process. Teenage years are, are, are notorious for being hooked into the peer group, and sometimes into primary school now. They're hooked into the peer group rather than on good values and Christian values. But children need to learn that, that their self-worth is based on their inner values, not like Molly, whose self-worth was based on being perfect and on being clean and on being all the things that she was based, she measured hers on. We all need encouragement, love, care, and positive views of ourself to develop a healthy self-image. Any comments or conclusions in that? Welcome back to your coffee break. We're at capital E on page four. Healthy self-worth is a biblical concept healthy. Self-worth is a biblical concept. In fact, that was one of the most important things that Jesus brought in reuniting us back to Father God, is to bring us a self-concept that was healthy. So it's fundamental. One, self-centeredness and the ego self. So you're filling there is ego self. And that's one of those um, terms that Freud brought into play when he talked about ego and id. The Bible uses ego, or the I, over 300 times in the New Testament, all without a negative note. In fact, if you look at um, Colossians, it starts out, I, Paul, do this, 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 and this. So I, over 300 times. It's simply a term for the entire person. We have so abused the meaning of this word that it sounds almost blasphemous, when we use it, yet all the New Testament writers talked of the I in their writing. You go back through and study it, I is used again and again and again. And even the word self in the New Testament is used in the same way. It's the Greek automatos, meaning one's own self, person. It's used as a pronoun, simply meaning myself, his self, herself, or the King James Version, thyself. In contrast, especially when you start talking about dying to self. In contrast, the Bible uses the word sarx in a negative sense. Applied to our style of living, it's the self-centered inner heart and thought life that he's after. In such places, it's translated as the flesh, referring to the seed of sin in mankind, the rebellious inheritance from Adam. What we received when they became independent and uh, self-directed, that is the self-life, the flesh, that is translated socks. Such as Galatians 5, 19 to 21, it lists all the fruits of the flesh, which results in sinful acts. 
an ever-present tendency to do sinful things. And that's what the Bible talks about needs to be crucified daily. This part of our nature needs to be dealt with daily. The sarx is different to self-structure of our personality, which forms the basis of our self-esteem and our worth in God. The flesh is the rebellious, prideful, self-striving part of our nature that Jesus calls us to die to. So it's not the I when we're talking about I went to the shop so that I can't use I anymore. And it's not the self in the sense of this Bible belongs to me, belongs to myself. It's not that self, but it's the self that has to do with the rebellious, prideful, self-striving part of our nature that came in through Adam and Eve. Because remember your three parts here. Your first part, God designed Adam and Eve, gave them his, his character, his nature, his all, all the characters of God were given to Adam and Eve. The ability to, to uh, imagine, the ability to bring um, the fullness of life that God had given them. So that's part one. Part two then, when Adam and Eve took the fruit from the tree, ate of it in rebellion to God and disobedience to God, that let in a whole lot of stuff into the whole human nature that is what's called the, the ever-present tendency to do sinful things. And then when you come to the Lord, there's a whole part of your personality, if you want to call it that, the whole part of, of your self-structure that is the new creation. So if you look at that way, everybody has two basic parts, the part from God-designed character, the goodness that you see in mankind, then the evil part that came in through Adam and Eve, and then when we accept Jesus, the, ever, the, the new creation becomes a reality for us. So if you look at yourself, you're two-thirds gods already. That's one way to look at it. So we have to be careful which self we're dying to. Two, biblical self-love is acknowledging truth. It's acknowledging truth. There are many who choose to find and follow his way. So if I'm in the middle of a discussion with Daniel and I feel my temper rising and I feel the anger growing and the, the need for justifying whatever it is we're discussing, when I stop at that point and say, well, Lord, what do you want me to do here? What do you want me to say here? What I'm doing actually at that point is dying to the self that want, would want to keep on arguing, that would want to keep on wanting my own way. So every time you turn to the Lord in the decisions that you're making, every time you turn and do what the Lord wants you to do, when the emotions would go one way, when the flesh would want to do something else, that's dying to self. So in coming and going through these classes and learning ways that God says you need to be, and then choosing to be what God wants you to be rather than following the old self nature, you have died to self. We can choose to trust rather than worry. Here's another way of dying to self. So choosing to trust rather than worry about the future or our present needs. Or we can hang on to the false view of ourselves, usually out of false pride, and then don't forget fear is in there too. Choosing his way means to move from guilt, others' control, and the fear of rejection into his light means choosing to move into what he's saying about us. Death to self means dealing with issues of a dysfunctional childhood in his way, rather than burying the past with any form of denial or rationalism. It means dealing with our own self-rejection by making godly self-love the second priority. Remember what the first priority was, and that's to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like unto this to love our neighbor as ourself. So self-love, a second priority. Our first priority must be allowing God's love into our heart and then returning that love to Him. Secondly, loving ourselves. As we saw, out of that self-acceptance comes the ability to love others. So as God loves me and I love God, I get enough of His love in there that it begins to affect the way I see myself. And then it's out of that love of God through me, in me, and return that to God, that then I can begin loving my neighbor as myself. Otherwise, all I'm doing is trying to give out my own self-centered love to somebody else. You've got to have God in the equation or it doesn't work. 
many damaged Christians are trying to crucify the little self-love they have formed during the abusive childhood. Before we can give ourself to the Lord, we need a sense of self to begin with. And I certainly see this in the counseling center many, many times when a person has just scraped together enough sense of worth because of God's love for them and then to, to step into a doormat situation because they think dying to self is crushing what little self-esteem God's given them to start with. And that's not the way God's principles work. We need to have His love in there first, and then we step into letting Him love others through us, ourselves. Three, our Father God is omnipresent. Omnipresent, our Father God. What does omnipresent mean? We say that word really without stopping and looking at the meaning from God's point of view. And what omnipresent means, God's everywhere all at once. And we can say that and not really mean understand what it means. But when you really stop and look at it, it means that God is big enough to give total 100% attention to every single human being who has ever been conceived, who is now being conceived, or who will be conceived in the future. He is big enough, grand enough, to be able to focus 100% on each, every single individual that has ever been, that is now, or that will be in the future. God is that big. He knows every heart issue, every hurt, triumph, and event that has ever happened to you, and to every person on earth at the one moment at the time. So that means when people stand before God, He will show them time and time and time and time where He did touch their lives, whether they acknowledge it, accept it, or follow God, He will be able to show them many, 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 many times when He touched their lives. And that will hit that way His judgment of them will be true. Creator God has designed and brought millions of galaxies, suns, and stars into being, and he keeps them all on track. He is that vast, immeasurable, big, and expansive. And that's what om omnipresent, omniscient means. It's amazing to me, I stop and think about it every once in a while, that scientists have not found the edge of the galaxy. They can't measure, measure out some hundred million years light, light years and say, there's the edge of space. We've reached it. We've got there. And if you're a Star Trek fan, they haven't done that way out in the future either. So God is out there. All those billions and billions of galaxies and stars and solar systems and planets and all a huge array that we will never see this side of, of glory, this side of meeting Jesus. Now, I think God has a purpose, and someday I think some of us will see that. But right now, He keeps all that in, in motion. So is He big enough? to be able to take care of you as a human being? Is he big enough to take care of every single human being that's ever been conceived, is being, or shall be in the future? That's how big God means. That's what omnipresent means. That's what omniscient means. And that's what omni omnipotent, omnipotent means. He's that big. Number four, God's actions in my life shows his love for me. His actions in my life show me his love. Recently a lady shared this story with me. You can read along with me if you want. But the Lord gave her a picture of, of herself and it was this big, huge lump of clay. That was her life when she came to him. And yeah, it had bits of wood and straw and rock and other debris in it, but it had the most beautiful colors that she could imagine. So right from the start, God saw value, purpose, beauty in her as a human being. As she watched, she saw three pairs of hands begin to fashion and work on this lump of clay to fashion it into this impressive sculpture in her, of her life. Jesus asked her if she wanted to see who these three pairs of hands belonged to. Out from behind the sculpture came her mother-in-law, her husband, and her teenage son. She gasped in amazement because here she thought that their work was just so negative in her life and she bitterly criticized every single one of them. But she could see that Father God was using these three pairs of hands, the very negative people in her life, to challenge her, to do the heart work 
needed to become more like Jesus. And that's how God does it. He uses things in our life if we will let him to teach us. He doesn't stop the hurt from coming. That's not part of the equation. It's like when it does come, how are we going to handle it? Any questions on any of this? Some of it's pretty interesting uh, thinking about, and that's one reason why we've written the notes is for you to take it home and reread it and go back over it. Okay, moving on, capital F, the enemies of good self-esteem. The enemies of good self-esteem. The following are a number of traits frequently found in people who struggle with a sense, with a low self-worth. So people who come to the counseling center that are really coming because they don't have a much esteem for themselves, much value for themselves, they very negative on themselves. This is five different traits that you'll find is pretty common. Number one, usually some form of compensating behavior. So whether it's workaholism, other compulsive behaviors, se sexual, social dysfunctions, mood-altering behavior, overemphasis on competition, possessing the best or being the best. So some sort of compensating behavior. And I suppose that makes sense because what what a person's trying to do is make up for their low sense of self-worth by concentrating on something else. Two, you'll often find arrogant, intolerant, or judgmental attitudes. In order to build up their own sense of self-worth, they displace their own self-hatred on others through critical or caustic remarks. Others might react with anger or annoyance as the prideful person points out other people's flaws usually the ones that they have themselves. Three, trying to be perfect in order to win other people's acceptance, or the opposite, using control and demands, so that others are demanded to be perfect. Out of the absence of self-worth, some people use power plays or games in their attempt to control others. So trying to be perfect, either such a perfectionist attitude that makes up for a um, sense of self that isn't very good to start with, or by demanding other people be perfect. So perfectionism, that trying to please others and be pleasing to others. Or number four, hypersensitivity, self-consciousness, frequent apologies, overreactions to criticism, or sometimes just being so easily embarrassed is a sense of a low self-esteem. Five, depression, and this is a huge topic. In fact, session number four, we're going to spend some time talking about depression because it's such a huge area when you're talking about taking care of yourself. Depression affects a large group of people with low self-esteem, self-worth, as they try to take the emotional pain inwards rather than be real with themselves and with others. So a lot of times emotion... Um, is learning, sorry, depression. It, it helps when you're trying to work on depression to learn how to take care of your emotions in a healthy way. One person used to say that depression is anger turned inwards. So instead of that person being able to get angry at the people who justifiably or not, they're angry with, they can't do that. It's like swallowing all of that emotions and it comes inwards. So anger turned inwards often causes depression. G, false self-statements, enemies of self-acceptance. So we looked at some of the enemies of self-esteem and the behavior. Now this is some of the self-talk that goes on, false self-statements that also tend to pull down our self-esteem and our self-worth. Number one, acceptance must be earned. Acceptance must be earned. I must reach a certain standard of goodness or perfection before I'm accepted by others or before I'm worthy of their love. If we base our view of acceptance on other people's approval, we will live in constant fear of not measuring up, of not being good enough to win their approval. So having to be the people-pleasing in order to win other people the op the, what's, what comes in very often is that if I don't win their approval, then what am I going to do? I'll, and I step into fear if I, don't approve, if I don't live by someone else's approval. 
If we are constantly measuring our value in others' eyes, especially since we can't really know what others are thinking about us, anyhow, we try hard to find the magic way to get acceptance. We can end up out of touch with our own unique, creative selfhood as God has designed us to be. So I'm constantly measuring myself by all these rules that I think are how you get self-acceptance, or how you be uh, rewarded for your behavior, or just how you're pleasing in other people's eyes. God has a lot to say about this kind of self-abuse. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul tells us he won't allow himself to be judged by anybody, not even himself. So Paul is right in the middle of a, of a passage talking about the other people around him and, and his the reasons why he is he is where he is. And he got to the point of saying, look, I don't even care how other people judge me, what they think of me out there. In fact, come to think about it, I'm stepping away from even thinking about how I judge myself, how I'm comparing myself with myself, how I'm determining whether I'm doing good or not, because I'm going to hook into what? Yep, into God's measurement for me. How does God say I'm doing? How does His Word, the standard of His Word, it's set for me? How am I doing with God? Second big one we run into, certainly in the counseling room. Two, if I fail, I must deserve punishment. If I fail, I must deserve punishment. To the degree that our parents use fear, shame, and guilt to motivate us, we develop this false assumption. Years of being punished leave a child with an ingrained belief that they are not okay. If, and particularly that's punishment that's far beyond healthy, godly discipline of children. I don't want you to hear that you don't discipline children because that's not what this is saying. But this is punishment that's based on fear, that's based on um, Shame that's based on guilt to make us behave rather than godly discipline that's not based on those things. We fall short of our goals. We then feel we have to be punished or pressured into doing better. Our self-punishment continues where others left off. We tell ourselves that mistake equals failure. Again, this is not how God, Father God looks at us. He tells us that we are more than conquerors. It's like if you had a precious son that was learning how to ride a bike. If he fell off his bike, you certainly wouldn't jump up and down and call him a failure and say he was no good and he was hopeless and um, doomed to never ride a bike. Well, hopefully you wouldn't do that. You'd call it a mistake that you didn't, that, that you lean too far one way, you lean too far the other way, and the child gets back up on the bike and eventually learns how to ride the bike because it begins to see that the mistakes need this correction, this correction, and this correction. And I think much of that is how God looks at us. He's seeing us as children that are learning His way, learning to do things the way that He wants us to. So mistakes do not equal and deserve punishment. Three, another very common self-statement, I must control others to be happy in life. When we cannot match up to our parents' expectations, some children turn to more devious ways to get approval. It's like the old saying that bad bad attention is better than no attention at all. This person believes that if they were in control, they would avoid the pain of rejection. By learning to manipulate through tantrums, a child exhibits the false assumptions that others hold the key to their happiness. Later, in ch- later, the childhood struggles for power and control are transferred onto their partners, friends, or work colleagues. There is nothing more frustrating than trying to control the uncontrollableness of others. In fact, we have no control over, the, over other people. All we can do is work on and work on ourselves and learn how to follow God's ways of stepping into being more like Jesus. We can't control others. We can't make them do anything. And if you step into that position of trying to control the uncontrollable, it's very frustrating. All you can do is control yourself. Also, when we struggle against others, we may find ourselves struggling against God Himself. 
He wants us to give up control by dying to self-centeredness. He wants us to give up our personal control by stepping into his laws and principles and let him control and change our heart from the inside, not from the outside in. The cure for all these false assumptions lies in really, really, really knowing deep down in your heart that God loves us just as we are. In fact, there's absolutely nothing that you can do to make God love you more. You can't work for the next hundred years and be absolutely perfect and, he, and make him love you more. Or he could take you home within the next half an hour and he won't love you less. It's not a matter of gaining God's approval in our life. It's a matter of tapping into it to be able to do the heart changes that he would like us to do because he knows that's best for us. So the cure for all these uh, false assumptions lies in really knowing, knowing, knowing deep down in your heart that God loves you. And that's the basis for good, healthy self-esteem. Then it's based on the reality of who we are in God. Not because we're such great people, uh, we do all these really good things and we have all these skills and all these talents and we show it really good on the outside. But if people really could see in our heart, it doesn't quite work that way. It's knowing that we are loved by God in the first place, that we don't need to be perfect to come to Him, especially since we can never be. If we could be, we would not have needed Jesus to come. So we will never be perfect. I'll tell you that right now. Most of us already know that. We'll never be perfect. So the aim of all the Christian walk is, Lord, where are you and what do you want me to do in all of this? So we do as much or as little as what he tells us to do in our life. Capital H, ways to improve your self-esteem. Here are four different suggestions or four different groups of suggestions that will help develop a better self-esteem. Research shows that about 85% of our self-concept is formed during our childhood, especially the first five years. And that's pretty amazing. If you know any five-year-old children, they're halfway to their adult mentality and in, in the, where they're at. And that's an amazing amount of, of learning that that child's had to do to get from birth or before birth, from conception all the way up to five years. It's an amazing amount of learning. So 85% of our self-concept is formed during the first five years. However, there are many ways we can improve our view of ourselves when we're adults. So we don't have to stay if we've grown up in an abusive family that, that didn't have a very good concept of who we were as a person. We don't have to stay stuck in that. There are things we can do. We're not the victim of those circumstances. Number one, think, act, and talk like the unique, special person that God has made you to be. Aim to see yourself through His eyes. Replace any negative self-talk with His positive self-talk based on his love for you and the reality of his view of your growth. His view of your growth. So instead of acting, thinking, and responding like a worm, when God says you're more than a conqueror, that means stepping into the more than a conqueror status because that's what he sees you. That's where he's called you to be. Work through your own fears of rejection and place God's opinion of you above others' opinion of you. And for, for most human beings, that's a big um, step forward when we can learn to do that. Because I reckon at least 99.999% of human beings have to work through rejection at one time or another in their life. It's just a maybe because Adam and Eve felt like God had rejected them from the Garden of Eden. But rejection is an issue that has to be worked through in everyone's life. Two, give up the right to judge blame and condemn who? Yourself or others. Outside of what God is saying to you, you can't judge yourself. You can't see truth because our own view is, is so many filters and so many biases and so many prejudiced views that our heart's hooked into. We really need to judge ourselves by what the Word says, not personally judge. And certainly condemnation is not one of, of God's tools. He uses conviction. The enemy uses condemnation. So to judge, blame, or condemn yourself 
or others. I reckon one of the biggest growth steps in my own life was when I started learning how to take my judgments off of other people and set them free to the choice of their will because they were going to do it anyhow. But I found then as I began to not judge other people, I wasn't judged as, judged as much by myself as well. God alone has this right. We all lack the insight or knowledge to judge somebody else's heart. Three, work to get in touch with your own feelings. Learn God's ways to handle emotions by recognizing where these emotions come from, how to handle them, and what part your mind and heart play in these cycles. Four, another big area, learn to accept your unique balance of good traits and those that need to be worked on. So a realistic balance of the good traits as well as those that need to be worked on according to God's view. Watch your heart reactions and learn to accept praise from others where justified instead of putting yourself down. Speak up for yourself in positive, healthy, assertive ways. Know when it is the rebellious self that reacts versus healthy self-worth. And that's part of the growing process to see where that's my prideful self rather than accepting a God-given compliment because God often speaks through other people as well. It's not ducking and becoming like the worm when somebody compliments you. It's accepting it as from the Lord, not building on that in a, a negative way, but accepting it because that's a God-given um, function to be complimented by other people as well. Conclusion? Maybe function is not quite the right word for it, but often God speaks to you about how pleased He is by using somebody else. Conclusion? For healthy, godly self-worth, we must accept Father God's view of His creation and of ourselves. This builds our sense of security, and we learn to trust in the way that He sees us, not us seeing ourselves, because that's been deceived and biased and unbalanced. We are allowed to make mistakes and can bring them to a loving, understanding Father who can and will wipe away the sin and the failures in our life. Our loving Father God is not just after helping us get through the pain, He's also teaching us ways to handle the roots of the pain to keep the pain from happening again. The question becomes, are we applying band-aids or accepting God's surgery? Part of the journey is learning to become one with Jesus, to give away our prideful, self-centered independence. Next week, we're going to talk about anxiety. Or sorry, I beg your pardon, that's week three. Next week, we're talking about stress and burnout, of how to handle healthy, how to handle ourselves so that when we do face stress, it's not something that overwhelms us, certainly not something that leads us into burnout. And again, it's built on a basis of good, godly self-esteem. If I'm taking care of myself and I see my signs of when I'm starting to get too close to the red line where stress is getting too much on top of me, if I'm loving myself with a godly love, and I'm listening to the Lord, and He's telling me this is where the boundary line is. I won't step into excess stress. I will not step into burnout. And that's a message that, that I enjoy teaching on because I need to be reminded of it just like everybody else does, especially this time of year when things get so busy. So next week is stress and burnout. Week after that is anxiety because if we don't listen to our body, if we don't handle our stress and our burnout in healthy ways, Often that goes into the next step, which is anxiety and all the different kinds of anxiety. But there is treatment. There is ways in God to overcome anxiety. And then as I've already mentioned, session four, we'll talk about depression. Because this is a huge and growing larger area all the time. Some doctors say it's the epidemic proportions of the year 2000 onwards. So we're going to talk about depression at that point. Some homework. Um, number one, go through the self-worth statements. You'll find on the other sides of, of this page. It's one of those tick the blank of areas where God, where you, you've heard that God says needs, you need to work on it. So areas that need Father God's resigning, 
some 40 statements that will help give you some clues as to your self-esteem and your own view of yourself. That's one. Secondly, monitor your self-talk over the next few weeks and really have a look at what you really think of yourself. Then write down any of those negative self-talk things that just seem to be coming up over and over and allow God to show you His view of you and all of that. Certainly tie it into this, some of the Bible verses that God can give you on how He sees you. Three, another thing that's a bit more of a long-term thing to do, but think through your childhood. What is the state of your own self-worth and self-esteem? And how can you bring these more and more into God's perspective? Fourth one, and this one again, if you don't get a chance to do it tonight, do it a little bit later on. Write out ten ways that you think Father God looks at you. And then how do these compare with the ways that you see yourself? Any last minute questions or comments? Okay, how about I pray for you and we'll call it quits for tonight. Well, Lord Jesus, as we have covered these notes together, I ask that you help each person to be listening to you. And Lord, just to pick out some of the points that you want them to remember and to hang on to. Lord, I know that you want to bring each one of us closer and closer into the image of Jesus. And so we thank you that that is your, your calling for us. That's your nature. And that's what's absolutely best for each one of us. And so, Lord, I ask a blessing on the people that are here, the people that are listening to this tape. Lord, that you can draw each one of us closer and closer to you. That you help all of us to know your presence, to know that you're right with us. And Lord, continue to apply your word to our heart, your, your conviction of your truth to our heart as we need it. Lord, we thank you for the people here tonight, for their obedience to come out on a night like this. And I ask that you continue to teach each one of us what we need to do in order to develop your godly view of us and a good self-esteem. So your blessings, Lord Jesus, for each one. And I thank you for your love. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>